everybody, welcome along to episode 108 of Percussion Discussion. As usual, I'm going to ask you to please check out all of our social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and of course our world-famous YouTube channel, where you can find all of our conversations, past and present, and you'll find the video to accompany them too. If you wouldn't mind, subscribing only takes a second, and this really helps get the word out to other drummers. Um, if you prefer to listen on the go, then you'll find all of our conversations in podcast form, and these are free to download from your favorite podcast provider so if that's your thing then please do it if you could also rate and review us that would be really really cool again helps uh other drummers find us and hopefully enjoy us as much as you do on to today's guest um a really great drummer in the uh, especially at the heavier end of stuff but he's got uh influences from all over the place um he's been playing with um the bay area legends trauma um, they were in great company uh, around the early 80s with the likes of Testament and Exodus, uh, a band famously known for having a, an incredible bass player by the name of Cliff Burton, who left Trauma to join the mighty Metallica, one of the finest bass players that the, uh, the metal fraternity have ever known. Um, but they're back in business. They have released plenty of albums more recently and their latest album awakening is out and about and they're just about to go on tour with queens uh, across the us so it gives me great pleasure to welcome the fabulous chris gustafson chris thank you so much for doing this it's appreciated well thank you man I, i'm i'm happy to do this well it's yeah. a real real pleasure so how's things going at the moment all good Every, everything is going good, man. Uh, the band uh, that I play and we're getting ready to hit the road here in March. Yep. 31-day uh, tour throughout the United States. And we're all looking forward to it. Sure. So, uh, and I believe you're out with Queensryche. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. So I, I bet. When when was the last time you did a, a lengthy tour, Chris? Oh, man. It, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a little bit of a spell. You know, uh, uh, probably, uh, yeah, uh, something like, like this, man, probably the 90s. Oh, it's been that long. I I, I knew you were going to say pre-COVID, but I didn't realize it was that far back. Yeah, it was probably the late 90s. Wow, okay. Oh, so you're really, really waiting for this then. Like, yeah, I mean, I've done like little, you know, seven week, you know, seven day, two week kind of things, you know, uh, you know. Uh, a lot of those, but as far as going out for, for solid six weeks, you know, that's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's kind of remarkable that, that we're going out for that long, to be honest. Mm -hmm. A lot of tours now in the United States are only for like maybe a couple of weeks, maybe four weeks, mm -hmm. you know, six weeks, you know, it's a little, well, they, hit, it's they, a hit little the big, they hit the biggest cities and then, and then that's that, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But it, it's great to see, you know, obviously COVID's been, well, oh, God. you know, everyone was in the same boat. Um, I, I know it's still there, but thankfully it's kind of in the background and hopefully in, under control now no. and, and it's not going to stop everything in its tracks again. But, right. you know, it's nice to see things coming back. Tours are happening. Bands are going out. Unfortunately, not so many American bands coming over here with, with the state of Brexit and you know it's finding it very difficult especially on a slightly smaller scale it's it must be tough that so i'm glad you, i'm glad you're getting out and and you've got a great yeah. album to promote as well oh good i'm glad you dig it oh big time big time i mean and do you know what as well as it being a great album the production is absolutely stunning on it i have to say really really good awesome yeah, the guy that uh, mixed it and produced it, he's been doing, you know, one or tag A, he's been around a long time. And we were really happy with the job that he did. Yeah. You know, the yeah. Band, the band seems to have taken, obviously, I appreciate there's personnel changes and things um, on the new album, but it, it, it seems to have taken a slightly new, maybe a bit of a heavier direction. Would you, would you agree? Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't half suit it. It really does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We kind of wanted to do it that way, um, get a little heavier, you know. And you know, it was kind of fun. It was fun, you know, when we first started coming up with these tunes, and I was coming up with different beats and all kind of trying all kinds of different tricks and all this stuff. So 
it was it was actually a lot of fun mm. you know yeah absolutely and i've noticed your, your drumming is very you love the double bass drum stuff you do is great and i love the way you punctuate with it and it's not just all you know you you really like to you almost uh, replicate riffs with it, which I, re I that's the kind of it's kind of the Vinnie Paul school of drumming that I <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's the kind of thing I like, you know, would you agree okay. with that? Yeah, I guess so. You know, I guess so. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've been playing for so long. There's so many freaking drummers, man. I mean, I, I go back to, you know, jazz guys, even because mm. I play I play jazz music, too. Really? But, uh, wow. OK. Yeah. So, you know, uh, for you to say that, that's that's actually a huge compliment. Thank you. Oh, it's just, just as I hear it, you know. But anyway, look, let, we'll, let, we'll get into the new album and everything. But let's I like to, in these things, go back a little bit to where where it kind of all began for you. You know, what was your kind okay. of first memories of music, if you like, Chris? Well, to be honest, uh, I started when I was really young. My my father was a big band drummer. Mm. And he he had worked with like you know Woody Herman and Dizzy Gillespie and a lot of a lot of you know really big name people throughout the fifties and the sixties. So music was always playing nonstop in my house. So of course you know the old story pots and pans and this that you know and then you get my first drum set and then you know go to school uh, learn how to read music all that type of stuff um, you know. My dad would make me, you know, uh, I'd sit in on some of his gigs sometimes, which was like kind of a nerving experience to say the least. That's where I pretty much got my start wow. from my dad. But so, yeah. so you're, you're, you're you're pretty schooled as a drummer then, if you, you know, if you learn to read, which is obviously you're not known for the jazz genre of music. You're known for the metal side of things, but it's nice to hear a drummer who has has learned to read and has has that in their locker i'm not sure if you still have i don't know but maybe who knows do you still read every yeah, day? I, mean, I i could kind of get through charts still yeah. but i if, if the, the problem is man there's not that many gigs that that call for that anymore sure you know what i mean so i'd have to like study it a little bit you know and then you know but yeah i do know how to read charts um I think it's good for a, a drummer to know how to do that or any musician, you know, it just, uh, you know, I think it's a good thing to have in your arsenal, arsenal. You never know. You never know when you might need it, mm. you know, but, you know, from a young age, my dad always told me, don't stick to one style of music, try to play everything. And, you know, I've played in bands. I've played in punk rock bands, hard rock bands, uh, Southern rock bands, uh, I did at <laughs> one time I was doing these gigs with a, an accordion player playing polka music. <laughs> you know, anything that anything that helped pay the freaking bills, man. That's you know, it's it's what it's I all mean? about being a working drummer. That's what you have to do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know. and, I, and I think you probably gained something, whether you think it at the time or not from every gig you do, you're always, oh, that's useful, or you learn something, you learn not to do something. That, I, I think right. every gig has got a value in it in in, in that way, personally. Well, yeah. Well, especially if you're playing like different style, you know, different styles and stuff of music, you know what I mean? I, I, like I said, I play jazz music and, you know, when I first started doing it, I didn't, you know, the old term bebop music, you know, the Charlie Parker stuff with Max Roach and all that type of stuff. I really got into that heavily, you know, and I was working with a guy a couple of times a week, an old bass player. God, he must be 92 now. Um, and he knew all those types of charts and, and all that type of music. He was actually a member of Buddy Rich's big band at one time. So it was wow. like a whole, yeah, it was like a whole learning experience mm. that, you know, was very useful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and I'm a yeah. great believer. If you if you can play jazz convincingly, you can probably play most styles of music. Because to 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 do that, yeah. and make it sound authentic is is not easy. I don't think I'm I'm hopeless at it. I'm a pretender when it comes to jazz. So I don't mind saying. I know I know a lot of friends of mine that just you know have always played hard rock and metal and all that that have no concept whatsoever of playing jazz. Yeah, you know, but I I kind of grew up with it because of my dad. You know. 
So, so who who were your early influences then, uh, drumming wise? W w was it jazz musicians over the the rock and metal guys? Well, in the early, yeah, I mean, I always, I to this day, I still listen to a lot of jazz guys. You know, uh, uh, probably pro if I had to say who my most favorite drummer ever was, would be Buddy Rich. Yeah, you know. Um, you know, I listened to, you know, Louis Belson, Gene Krupa, um, Max Roach, Art Blakey, uh, tons and tons of guys. And then I love, you know, Vinnie Coyuta and Billy Cobham and all those kind of guys, the fusion guys. And there's so many guys who play metal and all that stuff. Um, you know, it, it, so it, you've it's, got like a mishmash of, um, you know, which exactly. Is, yeah. Which is you know, great. Bonham, of course, you know, yeah. all that. You know, and then there was the yeah. likes of uh, of Bill Ward, who I always loved his oh, yeah. player. He's, he brings the jazz into it. And another one, and we spoke briefly before we yeah. recorded, I think Neil Smith from the original Alice Cooper band has a great touch oh, God, and yeah. a swing to it as well. Yeah. 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 I like. I always liked that way that dude played. Yeah. You know, that guy, he had like his own thing going on, which was really cool. You yeah. know, he had yeah. a set like Keith Moon, you know, and... <laughs> Yeah. It's cool stuff. So, yeah, did, man. Did you did you have lessons, or did you just kind of find your own way in into drums? Yeah, no, I never really had any formal training, to be honest. You know, I went to a guy um, and learned how to read charts, really, you know, really good. You know, and as far as you know, going and you know, doing things with teachers and all that. No, I'm pretty much self taught. Yeah, yeah. The, the old you know. school way but that do you know i i think some, yeah. some people say having a teacher is a bad thing because you've got somebody influencing you somebody some people say that you know it's better the other way but i i don't know as long as you find your own path and and you you know you've you've been very successful so who cares it's one of those isn't it you know yeah yeah i mean you know you gotta just uh you know it's just like anything you gotta have a passion for it and you gotta try to have a little bit of fun doing it yeah. along the way yeah. You know, um, there is a lot to do, as as you know, you know, learn, you know, playing drums, you know, so. Totally, totally. I've, yeah. So how long before you got into the um, the slightly heavier end of things? Did it, did, did it, was it a natural progression into it or at the same time, as I should say, really? Well, you know, it's really interesting because I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, well, you know, and this is like the early 80s. So there was a huge, you know, between like 1977, 1981, 82, there was actually a huge punk rock scene going, new wave scene going on in San Francisco. And I actually played in some punk rock bands, right? you know, and that style of music was super fast. Hmm. You know what I mean? So to, to take that style and go right into metal was kind of simple to do, sure. you know, because you're already playing fast as it is. You just have to integrate the bass drums into it. Hmm. You know what I mean? So that's how I ended up getting into, into the band Trauma, you know, is uh, I went from a punk, punk rock band right into, you know, pretty much into that. But um, at that time, I really wasn't, you know, these guys were talking about, you know, from all these other bands, man, they were just starting out too. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. Exodus. Testament. Back in those days. Yeah. I think, I think that back in those days, the only guys who I was really listening to were like, uh, you know, Phil Rudd from ACDC, um, you know, Bonham, yeah. uh, you know, Bill Ward from Sabbath, uh, you know, Vinny Apiece, yeah. you know, the double bass drum guys weren't, I mean, they, except for Tommy Aldridge, of course, and Ginger Baker, you know, um, it wasn't that as popular as it became. Mm, yeah, yeah, of know? course. Of course. It was, yeah. All, it was all ahead of you, wasn't it, really, at that point? So I mean, oh yeah, been, I mean, growing up in that era must have been. I mean, I don't know how old you are. I'm not going to ask that question, but so you know, at that point, late seventies, early eighties, I'm guessing you know you were kind of teens, maybe mid, mid teens. Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to gauge on on how it was. Were you going out to gigs and playing at that point then? That during that amazing period? Yeah, I mean, I was I was way underage for one. Yeah. I was just basically just like. Like, you know, sneaking into places to yeah. go play, you know, and in those days, was, there was a lot of places to play at. Yeah. Cool. You know, so that's how you're able to hone your craft. You know what I mean? And, you know, so, 
you know, it's all about that. I mean, you could spend tons and tons of time in rehearsal rooms and everything, but you got to get out and play actually live gigs. Yeah. So. So have you got like happy memories of that that era, you know, late 70s into the 80s, early 80s? It must have been an incredible time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a huge scene going on, you know. I mean, it was like, uh, you know, it's not like now where people have you know, computers and all this other stuff, man. You had to actually physically go out and do things. Yeah. yeah. You know. So, That's how it you should know. be. I wish it was like that now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there's I mean yeah, I mean, back then there was always concerts going on. You could go see the big bands, you know. I mean, the Cow Palace in San Francisco, you know, I remember I was just talking to a buddy of mine today um, about, I think it was 1977 or something. Uh when Kiss played at the Cow Palace, you know, yeah. and we were both at the same show. I mean, we were like little kids, you know. Mm. So, <laughs> are, are you um are, are you a Kiss fan? I I appreciate what they what they have been able to do for the last fifty years. Yeah, well. uh, I saw I saw them in two thousand nineteen, right before the pandemic fully went into effect, and they were they were freaking killer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been a lifelong yeah, yeah. Kiss fan and and I have this conversation with lots of people. I know Charlie Bernante, um, uh, Roy Mayorga was on, I think, a couple of weeks ago and he's he was a massive yeah. Kiss fan. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I usually oh, yeah. have this conversation. But, you know, yeah. so obviously at that time there was, there was, there was Testament, there was Exodus. There's, of course, mm -hmm. the, the Metallica, you know, it's an right. obvious one. Um, right. So, Trauma, you you weren't the original drummer, am I right in that? You weren't. No, the no, I, I joined the band. Yeah, I joined the band uh, right around 1980. Jesus, man, this is going back so freaking long. <laughs> 1983, I think. Yeah, sure. Yeah, right about in there, and then we put an album out in 1984. Oh yes, I remember the album. I've heard it many times over the years. Yeah, and then the band, you know, we we actually departed ways in like 1985 yeah you know and then i ended up moving out of la so is for... that when you moved away at that point so yeah. all them years ago wow yeah. okay because yeah. i mean that uh, obviously scratch and scream is, is is the debut and uh bringing bringing down the house i always remember that song and i've always <laughs> always loved it um oh, it's you know a great album and at the time the other things that were going on and obviously we, we and I'm sure you probably get sick of talking about this, but famously, of course, and I know he left before you joined, obviously the, mm -hmm. the late and legendary Cliff Burton uh, had, right. had moved camps over to Metallica. I mean, an incredible, that's that's a huge part of, of rock history, isn't it, right there? And I know yeah. you've probably talked about it till you're sick of it, but it's. I think it's important to keep that alive and, and Cliff's memory alive. Did you ever get to meet Cliff? Oh yeah, oh yeah. He he used to he would come to our gigs, you know when we when we were playing San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, most of the time he would show up. We we drink some beer together, hang out, talk. He would tell us about Metallica. You got to remember in those days. I mean, all these bands like Testament, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, all those types of bands were just starting out too. Even Metallica. Sure. You know. Yeah, of course. So, you know, but Cliff was a really cool guy. Yeah, and a hell of a bass player as well, that's for sure. Yeah. So so obviously when the band finished, um, it, it's quite a short run, isn't it? Four years. It makes you wonder for well, five, yeah, four, no, th yeah, four years, wasn't it? It makes you wonder what what might have happened had the band stayed together, you know, might have it might have kept up with the might of the other bands. Who knows? Did, did it was it did it just kind of fizzle out in the end? What happened? Well, the problem was, is like we were signed to a, a a label that was just starting out, Shrapnel Records. Yeah, you know, and I think it 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 just the bait. We just didn't have any direction. Sure. You know, we didn't have a manager. Um, it was like uh, everybody was throwing ideas out. Oh, let's do this. Let's do that. You know, da 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 da. -da. And we just didn't have any tour support to really go out and really hit it hard. And that was like uh, probably one of the biggest reasons why it it kind of fell apart um 
And then, you know, everybody just got busy with living and just, you know, girlfriends and whatnot. And the focus just seemed to like not be there, yeah. you know, and uh, unfortunately, that's what happened. You know, I mean, I wish I could turn the clock back, but I, did, I went on and did a bunch of other stuff anyways. I never stopped. Yeah. Uh, for music. I played in a lot of other bands. Sure. You know, so, so. you moved. Did you move to L.A.? pretty soon after after the band finished in 85 yeah yeah mm -hmm. and then so yeah. look, talk us through a little bit what 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 did you do after that because there's obviously there's quite a long time before the band reformed so what were you kind of up to at, at that point well i hooked up I, I i i moved down to la i knew of a few people that lived there so i got i got kind of involved doing a little bit of studio work which was really hard to get into that time at that time because you know you had the the the, the first call guys getting all the work, sure. you know, but you got to start somewhere. And I ran into this producer, a guy named Dito Godwin, that uh, went on to produce like, you know, uh, oh God, what's one of the bands, man? You know, I mean, he worked with like Peter Chris. Okay. Um, Graham White. Uh, oh man. Uh, I can't remember the name of a really popular band in the 90s. Anyways, he was a, like a platinum type producer. Yeah. And he would turn me on to a lot of work. You know, with different clients and whatnot that he had, he worked at a record label. You know, yada yada yada. But then I ended up joining a band that came into town from uh, uh, Sacramento, a band called San Elmo's Fire. Okay, I was in there for a little while. We put four albums out, uh, did a bunch of touring through the states. Um, then I moved back to San Francisco. Uh, I hooked up with uh, Frank Hannon from Tesla. And was in a band, you know, with him for a while, uh, did a bunch of touring and primarily just, you know, did a bunch of, you know, anything from playing rock music to jazz uh, through in the Bay Area at, yeah. and just staying employed as a drummer. Sure, sure. You know, that's what I did. And did was that an enjoyable period for you? Because obviously, I, I, I suppose you were living almost as a session musician and a sideman at that point, I guess. And is that, yeah, I mean, I, I, at one point too, during that period, I, I actually hooked up with a couple ex members from the band Crocus and oh, okay. that band. Yeah. Crocus was on a, a hiatus and I ended up, you know, I was in this band for about three years, flying back and forth and back and forth to Switzerland, you know, and playing festival dates and all that stuff um, over there and some tour dates. So I stayed pretty busy. You know, um, and then we decided to put the trauma thing back together in 2013. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened with that. Was that an easy decision to make for you all? Um, uh, yes and no. Mm. You know, I mean, I knew I knew what I knew what it would take to get this thing off the ground again. Sure. And. What I know now compared to what I know then, I probably, I, I, it's hard to say if I would have done it. Yeah, sure. You know, because there's been so many people. That, yeah, go ahead. No, sorry, no, 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 it's fine. You carry on. It's okay. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's been quite difficult to be honest with you. You know, because it's it it's just the commitment level of what needs to be in place to do something like this uh, is it, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. Yeah. And I'm sure you were in the back of your mind, you were thinking back to 1985. Well, this happened last time. And and I, I suppose were you when you reformed, you wouldn't have had any label behind you, I guess. You were starting from scratch, or did you have label interest? We had some. Um, that really wasn't the reason to do it, though. The the only reason that kind of catapulted it for us to do it was we did a re-release on a scratch and scream record in 2013. Right. And Mike Varney basically said, hey, it might be a good idea for you to have a band in case you get any calls to do some festivals, which we did. Mm -hmm. You know, we went over and played in Germany and, you know, 70,000 tons of metal and some other stuff, you know, and the, those those shows were a blast to do. But we've had a lot of people in and out of this yeah. thing since then. Yeah. You know, so. Well, I have to say the lineup now is is great. Um you know, as as the world dies is a great album, uh, but I find this one, the, the 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 recent release was it this year it came out? Was it last year? Late last year? I can't remember. Yeah, September of last yeah. year. Yeah, 
Yeah, it hasn't really even been out that long. No, not in the grand scheme. But yeah. a great, great album. And so uh, uh, is everything, everyone happy at the moment? And is it, is it you know, everybody ready for this? And, you know, yeah. have a place to be? Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody's stoked to get out there and just, you know, have an opportunity to, you know, play with a, with a really good band. Yeah. And, uh, you know, play for the fans sure. and all that. You know, um, we're, we're really, really looking forward to it. Mm. You know, big it, time. It, obviously, I uh, being from over in the UK, I'm, I was looking to the dates before, and I recognised some of the venue names. But what what kind of size uh, rooms are, are you going to be playing in? I don't, I have no clue. Obviously, being over here, you know, I can tell you the British ones, the, the capacities. But are they big? Yeah, yeah. I think you know they're anywhere from uh, like three thousand down to six hundred. Brilliant. It's a nice variety. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, you know, the the thing is, you know, you, I, I saw Judas Priest uh, with Queenswag open opening up for him not too long ago. And they, the place they played was a Fox Theater in Oakland. OK. And it was like a 30, 3,500 seat venue. Wow. The last time I saw Judas Priest was at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. You know, it's like 16,000 people. Sure, sure. So, well, here I in the state. Yeah, here in the States, it's like uh, this type of music is not exactly the most popular. You know, it's like Taylor Swift type stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, so, I, you know, people like what they like, but I know which I'd rather go and exactly, see. Exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, I think what she does is, is fantastic. You know, if you can make it if you could make a career in a living at the in this business, you're you're doing good. Absolutely. You know? So uh, yeah. as far as I mean, I'm it, this always fascinates me as far as um, traveling goes on a tour like this. W will it be will it be buses and planes or how how do you go about it? Is it is it all no bus? no planes bus? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And, Definitely no planes. And how 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 is that? Do you do you look forward to that or is it something you dread being on the bus night and day? I'm trying not to think about it too much. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a it's a lot of travel. Sure. You know, a yeah. lot of travel. I mean, I've been through the states more than once, coast to coast. Yeah. So it, it's going to be a grind, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. We're look, we're looking forward to doing with doing this with the guys in Queensryche. Sure. For sure. You know, and you know those guys are all road dogs. You know, they do they do it like I don't even know how many days a year they tour, but I know it's a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? So are you, no. are you, are you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> are you rehearsing a lot at the moment then getting everything sort of polished up or are you, is it a yeah. bit early for that? Are you playing? That's no, no, we've been, we've been, you know, not too crazy. We kind of go more into full production mode next week. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. Yeah. And it's sounding good. It's sounding good. Yeah. It's sounding well, good. Before we go, Chris, um, if you would give us a rundown on, what gear are you using? I'm I'm a I like to get gear yeah. every now and then. Just tell us tell us what you've got. Well, what you using? currently I'm I'm endorsed with uh, sonar drums. Mm -hmm. So I've got an SQ2 kit that I've had since uh 2000 uh when is it 2009? Yeah, mm -hmm. something like that. Um yeah, anyways, so I'm using my sonar kit. I uh I've had an endorsement with Peisty symbol since 1989. Wow, so. okay. Yeah, yeah. And then Aquarian drum heads. Uh, I'm using a head drum sticks now. Mm -hmm. um, I was using Regal Tip sticks, but the company uh, they just kind of disappeared. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. are you are you and, taking and double bass drums out, or are you are you on a double pedal? Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. I I it, I like to see a double bass kit. Um, uh, I'm I'm good friends with Rob from Reiner, uh, Rob Reiner from Anvil, I should say, and uh, oh yeah, and and, and he he's he always takes the double bass kit out, you know. So uh, yeah, you know, man, I I have like like literally experimented for hours trying to get a double pedal to work to my satisfaction on a single bass drum, and yeah. I have not been able to do it. You know, it it just doesn't feel right for me. I'd rather I'd rather just bring the other bass drum and call it a day. You know, the the, the look that classic look of a double bass kit. I remember <laughs> kids seeing the first one, and I'm just trying to think who it might have been. 
it, it, it could have been, I don't know, it, probably Cozy Powell or something like that. And oh, I, hell yeah. I remember seeing it. It was just like, oh, he's got his name on the bass drums. I was blown away, you know? It was just, I, I, I think you used, I think you used the 26-inch uh, bass drums. I mean, I, I still have my original set from when I recorded the Scratch and Scream record. Wow. Um, what is that? Uh, that was a Ludwig kit, mm. two, two uh, uh, 14 by 26 inch kicks. Yeah. You know, and then a, a crap load of toms are all in the same sizes 12 by 12, 13 by 13, 14 by, you know, 14. Mm. I got, I have all this stuff, Amazing. you know, still, you know. Do you ever play it still? I haven't played it in a long time. Wow. You know? I bet it sounds great. I love those square tom sizes, just huge. <laughs> yeah, they're huge. You know, they're huge. I, I wouldn't but, like uh, to mount a 14 by 14 on top of a 26, though. I think you'd have to have the stool light up, about here somewhere to reach. Yeah, them. I used to have, I'd have my, you know, uh, seat pretty high, yeah. you know, to do. But that, that's what I used to record that record, you know. Okay. Wow. You know. Amazing. So. Uh, <laughs> well, look, Chris, thank you so much for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And um, oh, good luck, good luck with the tour with Queensryche. And who knows? Let we, we may see you over in the UK at some point. Maybe who knows? I would I would love to get over there uh, at some point. Sure. You know, and play in the UK. I mean, what's the what's the metal scene in the UK right now? It's big. It's big. Really yeah. big. To be fair, yeah. There's lots of gigs, lots of clubs, um, mid-sized venues. It's it's thriving. I have to say, it really is thriving. Um, I was lucky enough to see, um, I think it was one of the first gigs post COVID and I saw at the Manchester Apollo legendary venue. I saw Saxon, uh, awesome. same, Saxon, Uriah Heap, um, girl school and diamond head all on the same bill. <laughs> there was like 5,000 crammed in and it was incredible. It was a, such a great night. How about that for a bill? Trauma. Yeah. Trauma. We played with Saxon. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we played with Saxon before. We played with Girls School before. Wow. We were going to tour with uh, Diamond Head. And then uh, uh, we we're actually going to go to Australia with those guys. But then the COVID thing freaking hit and ruined so many different things, man. Lots of plans. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, but hopefully things, things will turn when we get over there. I, I do hope so. And when you're over here, hopefully I can come and say hello and uh, shake your hand. Oh, I'd love that. Like yeah, man. Thanks, Chris. Enjoy the rest of your day, and and I hope the tour goes really, really well for you. Well, thank you, man, and thank you for your time as well. My pleasure. See you soon. Thank you. Bye, buddy. Bye, bye. There we go. Man.